again, everyone. I am Dr. Laurel Cook, Associate Professor of Marketing at West Virginia University. Welcome to another digital marketing lecture. Today's lecture is about Chapter 10, Search Engine Marketing. This chapter describes the importance of search marketing, both organic and paid, in the marketer's toolkit. Search marketing is primarily an acquisition technique. Whereas something like email marketing can be used for acquisition, but works better for customer retention. Search marketing works because the customer is actively looking for exactly what the brand has to offer. Search engine marketing, often abbreviated as SEM, is the name given to the variety of online marketing tactics used by businesses to market to users through a search engine. As many as 71% of consumers actually begin their buying journey by performing research on a search engine. Of those people, less than 10% of users ever go beyond the very first page of search results. On one hand, optimizing for organic search requires a lot of technical knowledge and understanding of how to work on multiple platforms. On the other hand, the business world is desperate for people who can do search marketing and many are willing to train entry-level people. Ultimately, the goal of SEM is to drive qualified traffic to your website, not to your social media, for specific keywords that relate to what you sell. So what are the two ways to be number one, or rank one, on Google? The first way to rank first on Google is organically, or through search engine optimization. And the second way to be on page one of Google is to pay for that right, and that's through pay-per-click, or paid advertising. Four ways to improve your SEO include creating relevant content. The content on your website has to be relevant, unique, and have value to your visitors. So what's a good way to know what's relevant to your target market? I suggest going on Google and using keywords that are considered ideal for your business, and then see what kind of sites Google suggests for page one. Current page one ranked sites are great sources of inspiration. Next, you want to make sure your site is findable. In essence, that means making sure search engines like Google can find your website's content. While we'll never know the exact algorithm that Google uses, for example, there are an estimated 200 factors that Google uses, and many of them involve very technical aspects of the code behind your content. While marketers don't need to worry about the actual code of a website, the practice of optimizing content for these factors is commonly referred to as on-site SEO and should be top of mind for marketers. Third, other websites. In other words, get other websites to link to your site, but only where it's relevant. These types of links help establish the authority of your website and the importance of your site's content. If you were dealing with people, you would call this word of mouth referral. In the online world, referrals come by adding a link that leads the user to another page. This is commonly called link building. Basically, think about a link like a recommendation or endorsement of your company and its content. The more sites that link to you or reference your website for a given topic, the more likely it is that users might find value from your content. And next, you need to have an analytics mindset where you measure the results of your SEO efforts on a regular basis. On the PPC side, here are four suggestions. One, have a pro landing page. In other words, have excellent, very high quality landing pages to your pay-per-click ads. This is an important thing that students seem to forget or not consider. But in general, this rule of thumb means not having ads that link to your home page. This is because your home page is really designed to introduce your company and all of the services you offer, and a potential customer is really seeking for a very specific solution. If you want a good ROI for your ad campaigns, you need to send a user to a landing page that's dedicated specifically to that topic that they're searching for. Next. You want to set up a target ad campaign. The idea of a PPC ad campaign is to drive traffic to your landing page. The huge advantage with paid ad campaigns is that you as the marketer have precise control over when, where, and to whom your ads will appear. Next, the content of your ads, often referred to as ad copy, needs to be 
very persuasive and compelling for your target market. Your ads need to be relevant and a good formula to remember is to have keywords plus some sort of key benefit that your brand provides plus some sort of call to action. All three of those ingredients make a great PPC campaign. And next, just like you did for SEO, for PPC, marketers must adopt, again, an analytics mindset. Make the habit of reviewing your PPC metrics, especially since you're paying for this type of SEM. So I came across some recent research that I thought you might find very interesting. So if I asked you, what is the most likely word in someone's biography on Tinder to get a date? How would you respond? So believe it or not, but recent research suggests that the word SEO that's included in someone's bio is enough to almost guarantee someone to get multiple right swipes. In fact, Tinder has kept this knowledge secret for seven years. Another fun fact is the number one search term on Bing is actually Google. As you can see, the search volume for this specific keyword on Bing as of last year was enormous. So like the image on the screen suggests, you might wonder what did we ever do before we had search engines? In order to get search results, did we really have to wait more than a few seconds? When Google was founded around September of 98, it was serving about 10,000 search queries per day. By the end of 2006, that same amount would be served in a single second. In September of 99, one year after being launched, Google was already answering 3.5 million search queries every day. Today, there are over 90,000 Google searches in a single second. And this particular number is up from about 64,000 back in 2018. And last year, this number was about 81,000 searches per second. You might find it interesting to know that Google says one in every 10 queries is actually misspelled by users. Needless to say, Google remains the dominant search engine, and much of what we'll cover today includes Google best practices. Let's dive into the differences between SEO and PPC more thoroughly. Think of SEO as the long game for your brand or website. The very best outcome is to have organic search results. As the graphic on the screen suggests, these are some of the elements that can help improve a website's SEO. Again, always think of SEO as natural or organic search results. Interestingly, a couple of years ago, Planners had a Super Bowl commercial where they showcased Baby Nut. The brand marketers for Planters created a whole new website specifically for Baby Nut merchandise. Unfortunately, the SEO of this site was not considered whatsoever. In essence, this merch website was not connected to the planter's main website. What the marketers at this company got wrong was they forgot to make sure that the brand new site they created was indexed. Making sure your site is indexed is an SEO imperative. In other words, your website has to be discoverable by Google in order for it to appear in search results. The URL inspection tool offered by Google, shown on the screen here, is an easy way to request indexing for a new website. One of my favorite SEO examples is an example that hits close to home. What happens if you use the keywords shown on the screen in Google? One site that I care a lot about, my brother's business, actually appears on page one of search results. My brother is a screen printer in the greater Nashville area, and here's a copy of his website. While my brother was never formally educated in SEM, he did spend a lot of time teaching himself how to use SEO specifically to improve the visibility of his brand. He was a small business at the time, so he didn't have money for a paid campaign. As a result, SEO was his best chance of getting seen by potential customers. I want to share a conversation with you that I had with him about the five suggestions he used to improve the SEO of his website. His top tip included what he did with his images. For all of his images on his website, the file names of those images included keywords. He also used a lot of header tags. So all the H tags on his website also included keywords. My brother also adopted a really good habit of creating one blog every week. The content of his blog included about 500 to 700 words. Google really likes this kind of approach 
because it can tell that new content is getting added to your site. Again, remember some of the suggestions I gave in the content marketing chapter. Make your brand a subject matter expert. My brother also suggested to use the Google Webmaster tools. Even as a marketer, you should be able to use and understand how Google Webmaster tools can help your brand. This is another important tool for making sure that Google bots can begin crawling your website and creating an index of its contents. In my brother's case, it took about a year before his brand, Take Hold Printing, was on page one of Google search results. Today, you can expect very aggressive SEO efforts to make a brand new website visible on page one in anywhere from three to nine months. Another really useful tool for improving your SEO is to use the idea of local SEO. This is another tool that highlights the importance of how your images are named. Now, if your brand doesn't want to wait any amount of time to appear on page one of search results, there are paid options that brands can use. These options, of course, are referred to as PPC or pay-per-click campaigns. There are important differences between SEO and PPC that you should consider. For example, SEO is perceived as more trustworthy by consumers. For this reason, websites that appear organically in search results are more likely to be clicked on. Because of this result, SEO tends to have the best long-term ROI. SEO is the perfect SEM approach if your brand has a goal of more exposure and greater brand awareness. Alternatively, PPC has the least long-term cost. With pay-per-click ads, you have quick short-term results and quick setup. Another nice outcome are immediate measures. In other words, your brand can have access to analytics to help you understand impressions and clicks and other information associated with your ads. For marketers, you may be tempted to use your competitor's name as search terms in your Google campaigns. Gillette received a lot of negative PR for this approach, and I know a lot of brands that do this on a regular basis. While there are no official rules against using your competitor's names as search terms in your ads, you have to make a judgment call about whether or not you're okay using this approach. So in the world of SEM, what's changed? An important consideration is the idea of brand SERP optimization. SERP is the acronym for Search Engine Results Page. This particular trend means optimizing your brand's entire digital presence. For example, your YouTube channel, images, everything. In other words, it's not just about your website. It's about all of your own properties and how they interact with one another on the SERP, the SERP. Have you heard of Google Discover yet? From a consumer perspective, Google Discover is a feed curated by Google on mobile devices to deliver articles and videos primarily. Google personalizes the content through searches and related stories. Consumers can customize what they see in their Discover feed by following certain topics. So you can see this is much like a social media feed, but Google describes this as searchless search where no query is required. The results in Discover change regularly based on changes in user interests or newly published content. Next, there are going to be huge changes to the entire way content is viewed and laid out on websites. And this change is thanks to Google Passage Ranking. Google Passage Ranks are powered through artificial intelligence. So passages, sometimes referred to as fraggles, are important because they really improve Google's ability to find and lift exactly the very specific information that users are looking for. Strong page and schema structure help with passage optimization, but it's likely also important to have text that's easy for natural language processing to evaluate and text that has a high readability score. Another new trend is one of my personal favorites, and that trend is to rank zero. In other words, there's a better ranking than number one on Google. A rank of zero on Google is often referred to as a snippet. A snippet is a result that appears before most organic search results. Google decides to display a featured snippet when its systems determine that this format will help people more easily discover what they're seeking. Snippets are especially helpful for people on mobile or searching by voice, and they commonly contain only one listing, but more than one may appear. 
Snippets are usually results that appear when a question is asked. So if your brand can answer a question that users ask a lot, not only will your brand be perceived as a subject matter expert, but there's a greater chance that Google will display that information as a snippet. A snippet strategy is useful for businesses of any size, but is of particular use for small businesses because it doesn't cost a dime. And again, a Google rank of zero is the platinum outcome. Another trend, often powered by AI, is that of voice search. AI-powered chatbots and virtual assistants are dominating right now. Voice assistant use through hearables grew by 103% from 21.5 million in 2018 to 43.7 million in 2020. Savvy marketers aware of this trend will use a multimodal approach. In other words, a voice assistant may simultaneously live on your mobile phone, smartwatches, smart home, and smart TV. Obviously, one assistant and few devices is the perfect approach here. One in every two search queries is actually powered through voice. When I first started teaching this course, voice search wasn't really on the radar. Then, a few years ago, one in five queries were voice related. It's amazing to know that half of search queries are voice activated today. Mobile users are actually three times more likely to use voice search. 31% of smartphone users worldwide use voice search at least once a week. As many as 55% of teens today are using voice search every day. Google's AI algorithm recognizes 97% of spoken words. Like me, you may find it funny to know that Alexa uses Bing, and it's not the only virtual assistant that uses Bing as its search engine. Apple and Microsoft use Bing as its search engine for its voice assistants as well. Because of the high connection between AI and SEM, it's important to have a good discussion about what AI really is. When most people think of AI, they think of this idea of artificial general intelligence. As of right now, we're not really in an artificial general intelligence world. Instead, we live in an artificial narrow intelligence world right now. In other words, artificial narrow intelligence refers to application-based uses of AI. So here's one of my favorite ways to help you understand what AI really is. What if I asked you to describe what a chair is to a computer? Before AI, you might have a series of zeros and ones that indicate that a chair would have four legs, or a chair would have padded seats, or some sort of rules of thumb for describing what a chair is. AI, alternatively, would have a huge database of every possible example of a chair. Maybe there's a chair with three legs, or a chair with no back. It would take all of these examples and learn from it and be able to make inferences about what a chair really is. There was a cognitive scientist and Dartmouth professor named John McCarthy who actually coined the term artificial intelligence. Back in 1955, when he began exploring whether machines could learn and develop formal reasoning much like humans. In essence, what a marketer needs to understand is that AI is a system's ability to, number one, interpret external data correctly, number two, learn from that data, and three, use these learnings to achieve very specific goals and tasks through a flexible adaptation. Here's an easy analogy. Imagine what it took for you to learn how to ride a bike. The child learning to ride a bike might fall a few times, but they're honing their skills each time they fail in essence, that's AI in a nutshell. More than a decade ago, you can see who the big tech players are in the AI space. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon have all had huge interest in AI applications. In my experience, the most provocative demonstration of AI is with Google Duplex, which is the voice-assisted AI. The progress with the assistant. As I said earlier, our vision for our system is to help you get things done. It turns out a big part of getting things done is making a phone call. You may want to get an oil change schedule, maybe call a plumber in the middle of the week, or even schedule a haircut appointment. You know, we are working hard to help users through those moments. We want to connect users to businesses in a good way. 
Businesses actually rely a lot on this. But even in the US, 60% of small businesses don't have an online booking system set up. We think AI can help with this problem. So let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. That was a real call you just heard. The amazing thing is the assistant can actually understand the nuances of conversation. We've been working on this technology for many years. It's called Google Duplex. It brings together all our investments over the years in natural language understanding, deep learning, text-to-speech. By the way, when we are done, the assistant can give you a confirmation notification saying your appointment has been taken care of. Let me give you another example. Let's say you want to call a restaurant, but maybe it's a small restaurant which is not easily available to book online. The call actually goes a bit differently than expected. So take a listen. See how may I hear you? Hi, um, I'd like to reserve a table for Wednesday the 7th. For seven people? Um, it's for four people. For people, when? Um, Day, night? Wednesday at 6 p.m. Oh, actually, we leave here for like after like five people. For few, four people, you can come. How long is the wait usually to uh, be seated? For when tomorrow or weekday or? For next Wednesday, uh, the 7th. Oh, no, it's not too busy. You, you, you can come for four people, okay? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Again, that was a real call. We have many of these examples where the calls quite don't go as expected, but the assistant understands the context, the nuance. It knew to ask for wait times in this case and handle the interaction gracefully. If you'd like, you can actually try AI yourself. For example, you can use autodraw.com to take your own hand drawing and see if Google can interpret what your drawing is supposed to be. You can also try AI on ai-writer.com for content creation. For marketers, imagine the application of AI as a pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid, where most AI is used by marketers today, is for task automation, keyword bidding, ad targeting, and CRM are examples here. In the middle of the pyramid is for user experience, so chatbots are the most common examples. At the top of the pyramid is the most exciting, though smallest, use of AI. Content creation is an example of AI application at this level. However, there are unintended consequences of AI. You may have heard of an AI bot with its own Twitter account. Tay is Microsoft's AI. And before her Twitter account became protected, it's interesting to see the content of her tweets, where they began and where they ended up. To offer some levity in the application of AI in search results, let me present another extra credit opportunity. 
It's often funny to see how two search engines, Google and Bing, have different search results for the same keywords. The image shown on the screen is one funny example, and if you can think of others, share them with me for extra credit. So you might be wondering if there are other search engines out there, and there are. Here's one example of a search engine tied to a sustainability-related goal. Another more common example is DuckDuckGo. This particular search engine was created specifically for users who were, as they say, tired of being tracked online, primarily by Google. You may have heard in the news that Google recently announced that third-party cookies on their websites are over, at least as far as its ad networks and Chrome browsers are concerned. This ban represents a giant change for the ad business and seems to be a step forward for privacy advocates, but it's a very limited change. In other words, this ban for third-party cookies doesn't mean that Google will stop collecting your data, and it doesn't mean the company will stop using your data to target ads. Instead, what Google will stop doing is selling web ads targeted to individual users' browsing habits, and its Chrome browser will no longer allow cookies that collect data. This ban is related to Google's Federated Learning of Cohorts, or FLOC. This term FLOC means that Chrome will still keep track of a user's browsing habits across the web and then place the user in various audiences or cohorts based on those habits. Advertisers then will target their ads to cohorts rather than an individual user. You might find it interesting to know that there are audio search engines as well. mp3juices.cc is one great example if you're looking for specific sounds. As you're engaging in SEM techniques, my lesson to you is this, don't reinvent the wheel. In other words, don't try to master SEM tools wholly on your own and think you need to learn everything from scratch. In fact, you can spy on what your competitors or exemplars in your industry are doing. One of my favorite tools is a site called builtwith.com. So for example, if you have a competitor's website, you can enter their URL here to find out how their site was built. Here's an example showing analysis of my website. I found it very interesting to know that it was actually able to identify the program I used to design my website called Zara. Another wonderful tool is SimilarWeb. Additionally, you can use a host of resources offered directly by Google. This particular thinkwithgoogle.com tool called Test My Site is a website grader for any URL. This particular tool grades your website against key metrics like performance, mobile readiness, SEO, and security. HubSpot also offers a website grader tool as well. This particular tool is website.grader.com, and it's powered by Google Lighthouse. Google Lighthouse is an open source automated tool for improving the quality of web pages. I use this tool for my own website, and the grader told me I had an SEO perfect score. For SEO, it specifically looks at indexing, meta descriptions, content, and descriptive links. Here's a reminder that you can become certified in Google Ads, specifically in search advertising.